Hello and welcome to the Varietal Show. Now, if you've never been here before, well, it's usually a little more homey and comfortable than this. But of course, we are coming into the season of scares and creepiness and weird fiction. So pretty much from this point forward, we'll be doing something on the uh, Halloween side of things. <clears throat> because, of course, this is a show where we read old folklore and fairy tales and about once a year during October some other old gothic weird fiction though tonight it is folklore um and if you've never been here before and you just want to get to the stories you should know that down in the description below if you're not watching this live there will be a timestamp that will jump you ahead to the beginning of the tale um and we only have one tonight called the hunting lodge at the cat's back river <clears throat> However, prior to that, I'm going to say some things. If you are interested in them, uh, you know, stick around or whatever else. But I will say, I'm going to give a little context on tonight. But before that, I'm going to give a little content warning for this and pretty much the rest of this month and next month. Uh, if you don't care about any of that, you can jump ahead to the story. That's fine. <laughs> It'll be in a timestamp in the description below. Now, first thing, uh, the first caveat, I should say, is that there is a chance I've read this story before, but I simply cannot find where I would have done that. I went back and looked through most of my videos, of which there's a shocking amount, because uh, I swear I've read this something like this before, but it also has elements that I haven't seen before, and it leans quite a bit more into the creepy, disturbing side of things than the version I'm thinking of. So it's... The, it, the problem with reading folklore is, is I've only really adequately started tracking what I read about a year now. And I've been doing this for about two and a half. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, my apologies if this winds up being something I've read before. I will definitely read it within a different tone this time. Um, the second thing, the content warning. Um, this is, you know, we're going to slowly more and more lean into horror and adult themed stuff. Now I've never really billed this stream as for kids, but I do know from things people have told me on social media and whatever else, that that is a thing that happens, that people sit and watch with their kids and fair enough, you know, I, I, I try to be as open about that as possible. But I do wanna give a bit of a content warning, um, <clears throat> as I will for most of these. These do lean into more, I'm not gonna say, it's not graphic. There are some stories that are graphic that we may get to later in the month, but, this one isn't graphic or anything like that, but it is on the disturbing side for a young kid. Um, it's also um, deals with adult themes. I'll sort of say that because I don't want to spoil the story, uh, but your mileage may vary. These are folk to lore, folk stories, not fairy tales, not necessarily for kids, and especially not during this time of month. These aren't, uh, they're not particularly the graphic or gruesome, but they are grim and dark. <clears throat> Um, so that's my content warning. Uh, I, and if you are here, by the way, there is a live chat in the corner that you can join in. And I see that Janera and GS are there. GS says, good evening, spooky graphic. Thank you. And Janera says, hello. Hello, Janera. Thank you for watching and coming back. Same to you, GS. Um, okay. So just briefly, uh, on to the story at hand. I'm not going to say too much about the story, but I do want to head off a possible misinterpretation of events of the story because I think it makes it a little bit better to read or hear anyways. Um, this story contains uncanny things, whether they're creatures or spirits or whatever else, doing wicked acts. And so given that this is a German folk piece of German folklore, and it takes place in areas that were largely dominated by the Catholic Church, the assumption would be they are aligned to the devil 
And the story does make some intonations to that. However, the devil has certain rules and is never generally played for a fool in a lot of folklore, and that is not the case here. Um, <clears throat> it's more likely that these are presented as sort of pagan spirits that got recast. We've talked about this several times. I really feel it in this story. More to that point, because they don't seem to follow the rules of the devil, usually does in German folklore. Uh, more to the point, uh, this is written more like a short story. So there's the hand of the editor who's put this together is a lot more visible in it. So th that might be an intentional act on their part. It's entirely possible. And, and um, uh, Jürgen makes this point in his commentary. It's entirely possible that this, and likely really even, that this story did exist in that region. But this is obviously a rendition by a single author. <clears throat> so with those things in mind, um, this is more about the uncanny world of old spirits that have weird logic that we don't necessarily understand. Okay, with all that out of the way, um, let's get to the stories. <clears throat> I'll have a drink of water and we'll get to talking. Our story tonight is called The Hunting Lodge at the Cat's Back River. It comes from a collection of translated folk German folklore from Jürgen Hubert, who is a contemporary of us, and you can support him on Patreon, which will be in the linked comment or pinned comment linked below. And I strongly encourage you to do that. You get little stories translated each month for a few dollars. <clears throat> Tonight's story comes from his large collection, Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles, in his section on fairies and the fae. And let me turn down the fireplace. Turn down the music a bit. And give you a little bit of atmosphere. Count Peter Vlost, a Wendish man from a German fiefdom on the Baltic sea coast, had been tasked to court the Russian nobleman woman Maria for his liege. However, he instead managed to win both the noble woman and her treasures for himself, fled with her, and settled down in Poland during the time of Boleslav III. Among these treasures, there was also the hand of Stephen the Martyr, which Maria had received this from her mother, a Greek woman from Constantinople. He gifted the hand to the Duke, and in return, he received the city of Kostinblut, as well as a stretch of land in Upper Zalesia. Part of this land was Goldberg and its surrounding areas. Now, one beautiful summer day he visited this region in order to hunt and he ventured into the katzbach river valley while accompanied by his servants and miners and it was then he suddenly beheld the rabindakan rocks before him when he inquired after the meaning of those marvelous rock formations, he learned how the pub of Sifantel Valley had been transformed into them. He thus decided to take a closer look at the rock cliffs and wanted to spur his horse into the Katzbach. Abruptly, the waves of that river rose up to a wild torrent. And it seemed nearly impossible to swim through those waters with a horse. Then suddenly, 
A tall, scrawny, gray-haired man who carried a white staff in his right hand confronted him from the other shore and called out with a terrible voice, Go back, brazen one. This did not prevent the Count from spurring his steed into the cat's back and swimming to the other side. But when he had reached the other shore, the old man was gone. Instead, a massive boar emerged from the Valley of the Gold Panners and raced towards the area where the Count and his entourage, who had now caught up to him, had gathered. Everyone now followed the boar in wild pursuit. The valley grew narrower <clears throat> and narrower, and soon the boar could no longer be seen. Since the path took so many twists and turns... It was then that suddenly the horse made a jump to the side, which almost would have vaulted both horse and rider into the stony river of the cat's back. It had shied before an ugly dwarf wearing a gray doublet. He stared at the shocked count out of an elevated opening in the rock with small, rolling eyes and spoke. Beware of venturing further. My father has already warned you against doing so at the Rabindokan Rocks. Leave my beautiful blue-eyed sister alone. And then the Count threw his hunting spear after the creature. But the creature fled up the mountain with the speed of an arrow. And his mocking laughter <laughs> was still audible out of the thicket of the forest for a long time. Meanwhile, the barking of the hounds approached again. And the squires joyfully shouted that they'd found traces of the boar again. Thus the hunt went ever onwards, and in this manner they eventually reached a beautiful forest meadow. Oh. Which was surrounded by tall spruce and fir trees. One of the huntsmen advised the Count to rest here and abandon the pursuit of the boar, for it might be possible that the boar had not been a true animal, but uh, some kind of apparition. <clears throat> Sent by the devil, which intended to lead them to, well, who knows where. Well, this made sense to the Count. And he pledged that if he returned to Goldberg safe and sound, he would erect a church in the Nikolaiberg Hill out of gratitude for his rescue. This is the funeral church, which still stands to this day. I don't actually know if it does. <clears throat> then one of the squires stepped before the Count and said, Behold, my lord, at the boundaries of the forest, there is a beautiful maiden sitting on a spruce tree trunk. She, she seems to have suddenly emerged from the ground of this enchanted region, for no one has seen her arrive. Now she sits there and acts as if she did not see us. She weaves a wreath out of flowers from the meadow. Well... Count, ever curious, looked around for her and was suddenly overcome by a great longing and a great desire for the beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed maiden, which made him forget all warnings about the infernal hauntings of the Cat's Back Valley. He strode towards her and asked her with a friendly voice who she was and what she was doing here. 
She replied, without shyness, that she lived in this valley together with her mother and pointed towards a small, moss-covered hut, which somehow nobody had noticed before. They had traveled here from distant lands, settled down here, and named this location Nylandel, or Little New Land. As it had appeared to them, like a new and beautiful land. Now the Count took the beautiful woman by the hand and let himself be led into a cramped hut by her. Inside, the only decoration was a beautifully carved boar's head. And when he asked where her mother was, he learned that she had gone into the forest in order to gather berries. The Count, who was no longer the master of his overwhelming emotions, urged her to give him a kiss. However, she resolutely, resolutely rather, refused and said that whoever she touched would be connected to her forevermore. Then, suddenly, the squire he burst in and said that that ugly dwarf had appeared in the shadow and startled the horses. The count hurried outside, but everything was quiet, and when he asked about what precisely had happened, his people were unclear whether they'd seen the dwarf or the boar. And meanwhile, the girl had followed the Count and talked him out of the notion that any sorcery had happened here and claimed that she and her mother had never seen anything uncanny in the area. In this manner, her words dispersed the Count's rising suspicions that the girl might have been an evil sorceress and possibly even that ugly dwarf's sister. He thus promised her that he would come back and return to Goldberg while secretly planning to build a hunting lodge in this valley. But the following night, he had an ugly dream. He beheld himself within the arms of that beautiful and strange woman and then his wife, Maria, stepped towards him, and she looked pale and distorted and put a grinning skull into his shaking hands. And upon waking, he consoled himself that perhaps his wife was doing the same to him on his castle in Zotenberg Mountain. He thus hurriedly sent masons and carpenters into that area so that they could build a small mansion there as quickly as possible. However, his astonishment was great when they had already returned by noon and told him they did not need to build a mansion, for they had discovered the most beautiful hunting lodge imaginable in the place of the moss-covered hut. But the region was otherwise forlorn and abandoned. Thus the Count could no longer doubt that he was dealing with an evil sorceress and decided to let go of her. Almost. For he decided to see her one more time and thus again steered his horse to the valley of Nylandil. He found everything like it had been yesterday. Only that hunting lodge stood before him like it had grown out of the earth. Beautiful, massive, inviting. He stepped inside and the beautiful girl met him on the stairs took him by his hand. And led him into her beautiful chamber, adorned with marvelous figures. 
On the wall at the other end, the boar, which had mocked him so the other day, was attached in the most prominent position. Now the Count claims that he wanted to turn back, for he could no longer have any doubts that the beautiful woman was no human being, but some manner of sorceress. Yet she looked at him with such sweet glances, enmeshed him into her embraces in such a manner that he would have needed to be of a different character than he was to resist such enticements. He still weakly thought of his distant wife, but the sinful passions were too strong for him to allow the memory of her to rescue him from the nets of this beautiful thing. Furthermore, she told him that they could not form a bond of matrimony with each other anyways. She was the daughter of the forest spirit of the giant mountains, and thus immortal. Thus he was only able to join a bond of hearts with a mortal human, and not one sanctioned by the church, for she was not a Christian, could never become one. Thus he was convinced by that clever sorceress to become unfaithful to his wife. And as he thought that he would not become bound in any way to the former, however, his thoughts changed when she later told him that, well, they were not bound by the bonds of matrimony. He was, nevertheless, Bound by blood to her from now on and forevermore. She would follow him with every step. And her revenge would be assured if he did anything against her will. And with these words, she vanished. The Count, however was almost bereft of his senses from the turmoil of his emotions and the pangs of his conscience when he raced back to Goldberg from the enchanted palace when he passed the Rabindakin he heard the mocking laughter of the dwarf <laughs> and who shouted to him that they were now related and thus he no longer had any reason to fear him once he returned to Goldberg, his valet approached him with the presumably joyful news that his wife Maria had arrived from the Zoltan Mountain during his absence. However, instead of hurrying to her and welcoming her, the Count began shaking as if he was suffering from frostbite. Finally, he revealed to his confidant that he had let himself be seduced by the beautiful woman from the forest and had become unfaithful to his wife. The servant, however, tried to instill courage in him and told him that he should be unafraid, for hell would have no power over him so long as he stayed near the devout woman. Thus he went to his wife, devout as she was. She had not yet expected him and was on her knees, praying for his safe return. But when she jumped up to embrace him, when he entered the, womb, the room, the forest woman stood between them. However, she was no longer in her earlier lovely countenance, but appeared as a fierce-looking demon whose glares intent on revenge made the count's blood freeze in his veins but the count took heart he made the sign of the cross and commanded her to leave the room for as a spirit of hell she had no power over his devout wife and as the latter then held him in a forgiving embrace the forest woman spoke with infernal laughter. So take her then. I return your oath to you. 
For you do not deserve to be loved by an immortal woman. And with these words, she lay her hand over the heart of the retreating Maria, and immediately the latter dropped dead with a loud cry of pain. And when the Count threw himself over the lifeless body of his unfortunate wife in despair, something roared next to him. And behold, the abominable dwarf stood there and spoke. The hour of our revenge has arrived. You have insulted the immortals. Every day you will cry for death a hundred times in the blackest night. But death will not come, and no pity shall reach into the darkness of your jail. And immediately after he'd spoken those words and vanished, the room filled with armed men for the knight Tobias, who'd been sent by Vladislav II to arrest him, had arrived. For Peter had been unwise enough to joke about doubting the fidelity of the wife of Vladislav, who was Agnes, the daughter of the German Emperor Henry V. She thus had spurred on her husband to take black revenge against Peter. So he was dragged away, thrown into prison, and robbed of all his possessions. In the following year, when the weak and cruel Vladislav and his scheming spouse had to flee Poland. He managed to regain his possessions with the aid of his brother of the Duke, Boleslaus IV. He returned to Poland in 1148, but he did not regain his eyesight, though this allegedly did happen, according to a dark legend. And he died on February 20th, of 1053 was interned interred in the saint vincent church in breslau which he had built and he had done more for the spread of christianity and silesia in poland than any other man for he had constructed 77 churches as well as several monasteries with his own funds but it doesn't mean he got his soul back, I suppose. <clears throat> and that is our first spooky story. I will admit, I went a little light on the first story. This isn't the most spooky stories that we have. Um, <laughs> if you think that's like the, the, the strong stuff, it's not. Um, it does follow some pretty traditional, uh, unfortunate um, <laughs> tropes uh, one of them being men are never specifically held responsible for their infidelity in these folklore tales uh they do face punishment for them but it's always seen as like well yes but she was just so magically charming and, you know, crap like that um but i do want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about um some of the things i'm eyeing for uh the next few weeks which is unusual for me because to be honest i usually check these out weekly because i want to make sure it's something i can bring passion to and knowing it too far in advance i don't know takes a bit of it out <clears throat> so one is uh that i'm looking at maybe next week is a bunch of supernatural hares as in bunnies uh because well they're pretty monstrous but they're not specifically scary it's more just monster stories uh, we definitely were going to talk about what are called wall riders, which is a version of a spirit that occurs in pretty much like many, not every culture, but many cultures, uh, which is a, a chest sitting spirit, the kind that you wake up in the night and see sitting on your chest, um, <clears throat> which has a presence in um, uh, certain Asian folklore as well. Um, I haven't found one yet but i would really like to read some more sheridan lafan who is not a folklorist sheridan lafan is an irish horror writer who kind of predates a lot of them and is a bit uncredited for i mean he's not unpopular he's not unknown in, in the right circles but he is a bit uncredited for pioneering 
a great deal of the uh, original tropes of sort of gothic horror. <clears throat> um, and uh, he is far and away my favorite, a writer of this kind of stuff, but he falls more in the weird fiction because we usually like to mix in some weird fiction. Um, I am going to look at... I don't know what you would call them, but I guess their closest analogy is basically German vampires. And then the one, it's not a long story, but it is worth it. Somewhere closer to Halloween, because I want to kind of up the ante as we go. Uh, I would like to tell you the German story about the long man in, uh, in the alley, which is a story that definitely could use some expansion because it's a rich one. It is interesting to me as well because it reminds me a bit of one of the only pieces of pretty genuine modern folklore uh, and largely credited uh, with being the first web internet based folklore, which is the Slender Man, um, <clears throat> which is uh, a phenomenon in and of itself, though I would say I don't think anybody has ever thought it was real, uh, but it does follow otherwise the tropes of being folklore. Uh, lots of art about it. There was a whole video game about it. Someone made a movie about it that was apparently very bad, uh, but I don't know. I mean, art is subjective, um, but mostly a lot of uh, doctored photos and short stories and things. Uh, but that's to give you some ideas of the things upcoming. Not all of them are super intense and dark. There is one story that I have read before uh, that was recommended to me to read again. I might, I don't know. There was another story that was recommended to me, but I wonder if it's too intense. Uh, it's not exactly fun horror, but it is horror. And it concerns the idea of a Selkie. Uh, and if you know anything about Selkies, um, their whole premise is a bit disturbing and abusive. <clears throat> um, but we'll see if that happens. So that's just to give you some ideas of things I have on my plate. And also to point out that the reason why we're running a shorter show tonight is mainly because... Um, there wasn't anything I had that really paired very well with this story, so I decided to just let it be what it is. <clears throat> so an unusually short story, a short night, but hopefully you folks enjoyed the atmospheric horror of, um, well, a dude who kind of got away with it, man. <laughs> like, I mean, his life didn't go great, but the thing that I want to point out that actually uh, Jürgen points out in his commentary as well, is the fact that the wife, a devout Christian, could be killed by this thing kind of speaks to it not being of the devil. Because traditionally, the devil can't act against a Christian person in good standing like that. Well, thank you very much, Genera and GS, for coming by. Uh, anybody out there who's lurking or enjoying these shows, I, I hope you did. Please consider giving it a like. The algorithm will never really suggest long stories and live streams, so it's not for an algorithm reason. It's just so I know that some people enjoyed what I do. Uh, if you really enjoyed it, do consider uh, uh, dropping a, a dollar or two in my buy my coffee, buy me a coffee fund. Um, you know, I'm not a rich man. I do appreciate that stuff. But if you can't, uh, I, that's fine as well. I'm just happy to have people here to tell stories. Um, I don't really have a spooky outro. I guess, uh, I guess I get a good sleep. I'll, uh, I'll smear garlic on the windows for you. <laughs> I don't know. I'll work on it. You tell me, what should my sign off be for Halloween? Normally it's, I'll keep the fire going for you, but, uh, uh we'll see. Whatever spooky thing I should say, I'm saying that now in your imagination. Have a good night and take care.